When we actually have 34 people, we'll begin. <laughs> Why 34? <laughs> oh, there's 33. 34 people said they were coming. Oh, I was like, is there a quorum issue? Or are we voting on something? <laughs> <laughs> As of the last time I looked, anyway, 34 people who said they were coming. So. So, uh, we'll give it, since it's right after lunch, we'll give it just a minute or so. Well, it is very difficult to get upstairs in this building, as far yeah, as I can tell. I, I was trying to find very, it. But. Very interesting challenge to, uh, to get upstairs. Uh, I, can, I, can, I think I can reveal that we ended up in a freight elevator earlier today, <laughs> oh, to, to try to get to the second floor. So. <coughs> Oh, you want to switch? Yeah. Oh, did you already do it? Okay. They're back there. Uh, so those of you who just came in, walked in while well, we're uh, still waiting for just a moment to start. Uh, we are uh, hopefully running a live poll. <laughs> I say hopefully because this is a technology trial. And uh, so if you have your phone or whatever and you'd <coughs> like to go vote on our first question, uh, mark all that apply. And just so you don't panic, we'll actually show the results of this a little later in the program. So it won't be the first thing you see. <coughs> so don't, don't get upset about that. It, it fits in a little differently later on. So uh, looks like we have one more coming. Then we can start. And as Greg said, we're demoing this uh, software. So feedback as well. <coughs> yeah. And we have no, connect, no commercial connection, no endorsement. <laughs> Okay, stupid question. Do I need a space between the 255 You do not. Okay. You do not. We did that just for readability. So you're safe. <coughs> Yeah, we figured it was a safe place to try out, as someone mentioned, uh, a technology angle on polling in the classroom. Well, Hope, I don't know about you, but I think we, we're ready. We've got our we've got our complement of uh, participants, great. right? Sounds All great. All right, very good. So I uh, think you're, you're leading yep. off, right? My name is Hope Kittner. I'm the director of uh, Creative Learning and Instructional Design for Aspen ILA. Um, I my love for online education really started back in 2002. Um, I worked at the University of Denver Sturm College of Law, and I put their first master's program, um, the Master of Science in Legal Administration online our first course was in 2003 all the courses then in 2005 so um, we encountered many 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 bumps and i made many 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 mistakes um, but you know in this process i've really um I, I think i've just i just i've grown to just love distance learning and having two children it was um, very helpful when i was raising my kids and going to school so that's kind of where my uh, passion starts with uh, distance learning Thank you, Hope. And uh, my name is Greg Brandis. <clears throat> nice to see some familiar faces in the group. I was uh, one of the founders of Concord Law School uh, back in 1999. I started uh, with them. And uh, at that time, uh, of course, there was very little distance education anywhere, uh, to say nothing of in the law. And we embarked on this uh, uh, bold effort to create the first fully online law school. Uh, back in those days. And of course we didn't have technology, we didn't have any of that sort of stuff. Uh, I especially appreciate some of my Concord colleagues being with me today. Professor Scott Burnham is here uh, toward the front of the room. Uh, Steve Burnett, who's our Vice President and Interim Dean, and the present Dean of Concord Law School. Uh, uh, Marty, is, Marty Pritikin is here 
uh, with us as well today. So nice, nice. Thank you for joining. Talking about uh, after being late. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you, you brought our number above the 34 who said they were coming. So that's uh, that's a big that's a big deal. Uh, so it was a, uh, a, the interesting part about that puzzle was how do you do this stuff? Because in those days it really wasn't very well known. And we sort of stumble our way into what turns out today to be a lot of what folks consider best practices. But we stumbled our way into them. I mean, it is as if we pretended we were the best thinkers and so on around. We did read the literature <laughs> and look at analogs in other places. Um, I come to this particular angle of the topic for a little story that I'd like to tell you uh, about how we got here. And that is something that's going on right now in the state of California. As you know, California is the only state that allows unaccredited law schools and state accredited law schools allows their students to sit for the bar exam. There's an effort in California to eliminate unaccredited law schools, force all of them to become accredited under the state's rules. I spent the last three years or so of my life working with the State Bar of California to create rules for that transition, rules that would have the effect of sta uh, including standards that would allow fully online law school programs to be accredited by the state of California. And I bring you this topic because in connection with those conversations, we had many conversations around what is really uh, the goal of accreditation. And I think you'd all agree the goal of accreditation is to ensure a high quality education for the students. Would, that, would we all say that's pretty much the reason we have accreditation? Turns out, you don't need the same kinds of standards to ensure high quality education. <laughs> you can ensure it by a lot of different means. And so uh, the genesis of me thinking about this topic was, uh, well, do we really need this word anymore if in fact learning design is evolving towards something that is uh, kind of neutral with respect to the delivery platform that's actually used and focuses on other things things like outcomes and other stuff that folks talk about. So that's kind of one of the background things that's going on. Uh, by the way, those rules we expect to see reach uh, the State Bar of California's higher levels, including the Supreme Court of the State of California, uh, for their approval and review by the end of this year. Uh, so this is something that is finally, after many years, actually happening uh, in California. So that's kind of how I come to talk about this topic a little bit. All right. So I hope you want to tee us up with the, the uh, framing questions. Right. <clears throat> Distance education. Is it really education that is merely evolving? Or is it truly different? Is it a completely different way of teaching and learning? <clears throat> this is really kind of, as Greg said, why we are here today. Do we keep the word or do we not keep the word? Is, is, it, is distance education the best way to reference? Got a question. Okay. Okay. All right. So we are for those that are new to new to the room. We are demoing a, a, a holding software called Mentimeter, and we've had a few kinks. So if you get a moment, if you could go to menti.com and use the code. So We're not going to go. Oh, in Mentimeter. Oh, I'm sorry. You want to go in Mentimeter. Excuse me. Oh, look at that. We're not supposed to see that. Okay. So this is live. So post your answers. Because it's live, is uh, what you're seeing influencing any of your choices? <laughs> 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 Nobody can't. <laughs> <laughs> Plenty of room down front. You know, that's what they always say, right? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So when it works, it's kind of neat. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Oh, of course. <laughs> Please join us. We hope it'll be a stimulating conversation. So we thought it'd be good to start with a little bit of fun or about a, a question. And uh, so, so I see the dominant response is 1875 for correspondence. Well. All right. 
Oops. Yeah. I'm there. I'm there for you. You just want to go page down. Uh, the correct answer is in 1970, uh, I'm sorry, in 1728, Caleb Phillips placed an ad in the Boston Gazette, which read, person in the country desirous to learn this art may be having several lessons sent weekly to them be as perfectly as those that live in Boston. He was selling shorthand lessons. While this is not two-way communication, so there is some question, it is in fact distance education. It is the first known reference to distance education. Um, to think here that this the, the distance education truly has evolved over 300 years, to me is just, is, is just remarkable. Um, the progression of distance learning has, has, has been parallel to the advancements made in technology, in communication, and we are utilizing that to reach our students, um, to connect them, to learn and to grow. And I just feel that, you know, to think 300 years for me and, and think the, to think the changes that we've made in the traditional classroom setting over the years um, and, and, and then consider the changes that have been made in distance education, it's truly, I mean, for me it's unprecedented, but um, of course the historical aspect of online education, distance education is, is of great interest to me. So correspondence is, of course, what it really was. And correspondence was the dominant model of distance education for a very, very long time. Uh, we don't have to say very much about history. Nobody likes to spend a lot of time on that. But in the law, of course, we can all point to a very famous uh, self-taught lawyer. Lincoln, right, is the famous example. And we don't have to go too much further than that to say there's long precedence in the law for us doing this kind of work. Uh, we want to move on and talk a little bit about things like learning science. Now, this is my effort to boil down what we do when we teach into one single page. And uh, it has a number of kind of components to it. And why does it matter when we talk about whether we need to keep calling it distance education or not? Because these process steps, these idea and creativity and analytical and critical thinking and memory reinforcement activities, can be performed in a lot of different ways. We do that in certain <coughs> ways in the live classroom. We do it in certain ways by the assignments we give to folks outside, their live classroom experiences. And we do it in the learning design of online courses, in the instructional design models that are thoughtful about how you're achieving particularized aspects of, of learning. So again, we need to have uh, this, um, uh, all these different components. Uh, we need to understand how material fits together, for example, uh, in process knowledge. How do things interrelate and connect? If we are able to do that effectively, then students retain material more effectively. <coughs> so let's give you an example of that. Let's talk about uh, the emotional learners for a second. When you uh, encounter a student who connects with the topic because they connect with the people who experienced it in reading a case, you have a student who's employing that process knowledge, that emotional connection knowledge, in order to understand the material. Does that make sense to everybody when I say that? Mm -hmm. And that's one of those things that we have to consciously design in, or can consciously design in. And we can do that, of course, in both of these uh, modalities. The big thing that I think distance learning contributes to uh, the study of law is this intentionality to achieving the pieces that folks actually need in order to be able to uh, grasp the material in the first place and retain the material and then apply it to additional situations. So you've got your analytical and critical processes there. Those are skills, but they're also ways of thinking about connecting material. And those things are fundamental to both kinds of education. One of the things we'll talk about today is whether we need this word and we need this distinction. Uh, and the reason for asking that question is, of course, uh, do we? Are we all doing this now? Are we doing this in the live classroom setting, in the typical uh, traditional law school? Uh, and if we are, then it becomes less important to draw a distinction between these two ways of going about things. All right, so then, uh, just a personal reflection back, if I could say. I presented at Cali in 2002, and uh, the world was a very different place back then. And these are some of the comparative differences uh, that uh, you would, would, would have seen at the time. Yes, in fact, uh, when we started the law school, we were dial-up ruled the world. And uh, we pretty well had to build everything so that it could be done 
with your old 56K uh, modems. Um, and that was interesting when you were trying to do live streaming classes in 1999, as we did. Uh, and of course, uh, lots of other things that are a little bit different. We now have a lot more variety in law schools than we had in those days. We have a lot more assessment variety. In other words, different ways that we're assessing learning in law schools than we had in those days. And of course, in those days, we were pretty well standing alone as the only online JD program. Now I count six, most of which are not in ABA accredited schools. But as we all know, there's at least two that are predominantly hybrid programs that are approved <coughs> ABA programs operating, and there will likely be more. Uh, so it is a very different world today than it was uh, back in 2002. And what, why I mention that? Because education has really come a greatly long way. Uh, so all of us are doing things a lot differently, differently than we were back in those days when we first introduced distance education into the mix. So then I will say to that, so is it evolving? That's the question. Is it, a is, it is education evolving or is this a totally different thing? So, all right, so you may have set this one up, Hope. Some of you are old enough <laughs> to remember this. Maybe not all of you, but uh, some will. Uh, this is about 1973, Saturday Night Live. Jane Curtin, Danny Aykroyd, on uh, that segment that they still do called Weekend Updates, the, the phony news segment. And uh, we're not going to show the clip that is the most famous clip probably of this. The one that is ranked as like one of the top 100 comedy sketches of all time. Because uh, remarkably, our sensitivities have changed a lot since 1973. <laughs> and we didn't think it was appropriate to show the clip, so don't worry. <laughs> but we did like the idea of point and counterpoint. And uh, so that's what we're going to do on this topic uh, today. We're going to introduce some points and counterpoints. Uh, and uh, that's our, that'll be our model. And then, oh, I think, Hope, you're, you're doing this next one, right? So again, as I was saying, is education merely evolving? Should we lose the word point? Or is it really truly a different way of learning? Counterpoint. Keep the word. So that's what we're gonna that's what we're gonna do today. Yeah. I will say when we when Greg and I first got together, he came to me and he said, Have you seen this? And of course I, I was just being born when this when this <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but I looked at it, I said, that is hysterical. He says, well, let's do this. You be the point, and I'll be the counterpoint, and let's do a skit. And he's like, I'll be the miserable Luddite. Yeah. And, you can, and we, 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 were, we were going to do it, and we were afraid that maybe it, wasn't, maybe it was too much. So we are going to refrain from that, and instead we were just going to hit the points and the counterpoints yeah. and discuss them. It won't be as much fun or as funny, <laughs> but it will it'll, it'll still get to the topic uh, reasonably well. So, and this is, your, this is your guide to keeping track of which side we're on, right? When we say point, we're on the let's get rid of using this word to describe the difference of, differences in different kinds of education. And when we're saying counterpoint, we're saying, no, there's a reason to keep that word and really use it uh, for some reason. And we think this is actually a more subtle question than it at first appears. Uh, we all who believe in technology and distance education and so on, when it comes to the question of using that phrase or not using that phrase, it's a more interesting question than it first looks. So you're uh, going to signpost. I'm signposting along the way. These are our uh, four main areas of point and counterpoint that we hope will trigger discussion <coughs> among everybody uh, when we get to that spot. So the first one is this question of, uh, well, we're doing a lot of teaching with technology. So why bother? But maybe on the other side, it's useful for market differentiation. Maybe there's a reason we need that word. Uh, second, uh, we're doing modern learning in both settings. So is it a little deceptive that uh, we're still distinguishing them? Uh, on the other side, folks think, no, it's actually important because uh, people need to know what they're getting into when they sign up for a program. Uh, then we look a little bit at how things are being conducted in classes, and we have uh, Similar, similar sorts of assignments in both settings. All folks are doing assignments uh, of similar kinds now in many of the best run classes. So perhaps, again, it's not uh, necessary uh, to the distinction that asynchronous learning is actually really different and perhaps really valuable. Uh, so another reason you might want to keep it. And then we'll talk about lecture halls a little bit versus the online classroom uh, as well. So that's kind of laying out uh, the <laughs> process that we're going to use to 
work our way through these points and <coughs> counterpoints that we hope will stimulate uh, the conversation later. Okay, so Hope, I think you're up for the next one, right? Yep. So I'll give you a second to, to take a look, but um, give a second. Give, my, yeah, give, yeah. A, give a second. It takes a second to read the slide. So we are currently using tech, various technologies in both the face-to-face -face and, of course, in the online classroom. Many, much of the technology that we're using in the face-to-face -face or brick-and-mortar classroom is very much the same as we're using in the online. We see Zoom being used in the traditional classroom setting. We see Panopto, where you're streaming classes used in the, in the online classroom. Does that because these class, because the technology is being used in both classrooms, does that warrant the distinction? Next counterpoint: market segment. Um, learners have preferences to their learning styles. Some learners feel that feel that um, classes in the face-to-face -face or brick-and-mortar classroom is essential for for learning and for growing. Others believe online because it's flexible, or they just prefer that learning style. So perhaps the, the, the distinction is necessary for the learners to be able to identify their preferred learning style. Uh, so we thought we would test this with an example from a different market. Oh, I think, so Hope, I think you were going to talk about I was this. Good. That's yeah. all right. Go ahead. So let's chat about this market segmentation. Well, what is market segmentation? It's the process of dividing a market into groups based upon the characteristics. <coughs> so. If you were to, to choose a restaurant, which type of restaurant would you choose? Would you choose, and if we could do a show of hands because we didn't do this as a poll, let's say fast food. And by the way, by frequency, sort of by how often you choose it. Fast casual. Okay. Family dining. Contemporary casual and fine dining. Okay. <laughs> so the, uh, the notion of this is that consumers have preferences, right? Uh, there's no right or wrong answer here. It's just a variety of preferences. And that's why every business, every market designs different ranges of products to meet different segments of the market, right? Now in education, in legal education, there's been for 100 years, well, certainly since Langdell, anyway, that's more than 100 years, uh, a pretty uh, monolithic product segmentation, wouldn't you say? In other words, everybody strives to be very similar in our business. And that kind of runs contrary to what we know about most markets and what we just, by the way, proved ourselves in just a few seconds ago. And so the question is, do we need to continue to carry these distinctions because, in fact, they matter to the consumers uh, to understand the differences in what they're choosing. And, in fact, maybe it's better for education that we're able to um, point to distance education as being different in certain ways. So it's a more interesting question, perhaps, than it might at first appear, whether this is a word we want to keep or, or lose uh, with respect to it. Because as we said, it's all education. Just as with any of these restaurants, you'll get nutrition and calories and other things. But you'll choose an experience that suits you for that particular moment in time or that particular thing. So when you chose the one that you go to more often, uh, why did you choose that more often than something else? It has something, we think, to do with the experience. That making sense? Yeah. So uh, again, it becomes a more subtle question as to whether this is a word we want to keep or, or use or get rid of. All right. Sorry. No, Just no, had to elaborate there that's great. on that one. All right. So I'm, I'm signposting. Uh, this is probably an appropriate pause to stop and a moment to pause and say, what do you think about this one? What do you think so far? Yes. Please. Um, so in the first point, counterpoint, you say, well, there's so much technology in the classroom that 
it's not even a distinction anymore. Yep. Yet when you talk about market segmentation, you're, that's inherently talking about distinction. Yep. So are you saying that, that, that it's sort of now all in the splendor and we need to kind of redefine what the distinctions are? Is that, is, because if you're talking about market segmentation, it can't all be just a mess in a blender. Yep. Right? There is no segmentation exactly. in that, right? Yep. But, but the first counterpoint is sort of saying that. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, the point is arguing, in fact, that it's all mixed together so much at this point, which is probably a little premature to argue that point, to argue it that way, but let's just assume that we're getting there uh, for the sake of the argument, uh, that it's a little misleading to have this distinction, this stuff out there called distance education that is some kind of alien beast, when, in fact, that's what we're doing in the classroom. We're, we're using most of those or many of those same tools in our live classroom settings now. So at some point... Does it become even dece deceptive to draw the distinction between the two? Do we need to stand up in a live classroom and say, well, this is what we're, we're using these tools, and we'll be more uh, straightforward about that at some point? And that's, that's the question that the, the point-counterpoint raises. Steve? Isn't the fundamental problem, though, that the, the use of the distance in, in education in the same sense as a pejorative for traditionalists One of the reasons some of us who are fans of distance education might want to get rid of that word, right? Because it has that pejorative distinction. Now, yeah, well, it's I would coming say up. On the other side of that is maybe it's because of the distinction that we're identifying it. Why it's not the blender is because of the name, because the term we we have the term distance in there. That's why there is no distinction. I mean, I'm sorry. That's why there is a distinction. And that's the argument for keeping it as a differentiator in the marketplace. But it really doesn't have to do with tech. Sorry. Yeah, I don't think it has to do with tech. Because you, you can take a distance <coughs> learning course, correspondence course, without any tech at all. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you certainly can. And it isn't necessarily the technology. It's really the learning design, which is why the learning science thing was up there before. The intentionality of learning design that's typically applied, because it has to be, practically speaking, in the distance education world, that is now becoming much more the norm in the rest of the world. And of course, the evolution of ABA standards is pushing it further in that direction. Jack. The market differentiation is important. I think the problem is distance learning is not useful. And the reason is distance generally is deemed to include two kinds of distance. One is geographic, the other is temporal. Yep. And geographic distance is increasingly irrelevant. If you watch a well-taught synchronous class on a good platform with yep. the right technology, it's done almost the same way as the traditional bricks and mortar classroom. So it saves people driving on <coughs> campus, but other than that, it's about the same thing. On the other hand, a well-done asynchronous course that's delivered at a different time for everybody, 24-7 availability, that's radically different. And so I think the problem is we're, we're, when we use distance learning to yep. talk about both synchronous and asynchronous delivery, the term's not useful yep. because one is increasingly just like the traditional, and one, as we learn to do it better, yep. is increasingly different and arguably better. And arguably better. So right. I, I think the distance learning term is not useful just because we're trying to do too many things with it. All right, fair enough. We'll take one, we'll take two more. Two more. Yeah, I have you a good context on this because I was homeschooled all the way through high school, yeah. went to in-person for college, and then did a, a long-distance online program for my grad school. So I've experienced the full range of options. Yep. Um, I'm witnessing at Chicago Kent our faculty becoming increasingly interested in different forms of pedagogy. Yep. Most legal professors had never been trained in pedagogy at all. They were excellent law students, and so they became law professors. Yep. And their way of learning is that sort of, you know, 
it translates very well to that synchronous, but when they're learning new techniques, if they're doing group work, if they're doing back and forth, that's that much harder for them to translate into an online program. Mm -hmm. I've experienced very well done group work in an online platform, but that requires different tools and techniques than the basic things that most schools are using when they set up online programs. They're not necessarily thinking about anything beyond the sort of like Socratic method and lecture sort of thing. So you have to factor in the fact that maybe the way we've always been teaching isn't the most effective way, it's just the easiest. And then the levels of training that takes for the faculty to change their framework for how they're communicating is difficult, I think. And it's really crucial to note that <coughs> if that transition is to be made successfully, they need good guides. Yes. Guides on the sides. And so it's wonderful that you're all here and particularly talking about this with us because you're the guides in most cases. You're the folks who would be the guides in your, in your schools to help this, the, these faculty kind of learn a new way of thinking about pedagogy and thinking about how to develop a course with this intentionality we've talked about toward uh, appropriately embedding the learning and achieving it with the, with the students, achieving retention and so on. Sir, yeah, that's one, of the, on this one of the issues we have with, with the term uh, distances, we're a co-location campus, mm -hmm. but our classes are live in both. Yep. So I may have a professor in Boise teaching to half the students are in Moscow, or vice versa on the other way. Yep. Whereas, you know, somebody says distance learning, a lot of times they're thinking that it's a recorded class versus yes. you're, you're actually interacting. It's a full interaction between professor and students in a live situation. Yep. So we need a better word for that, too, that just differentiates that from the other stuff that people might assume. Uh, I had a colleague tell me recently the big problem with that word is that people have taken a so-called distance learning CLE somewhere along the way and found it not very engaging. So they think that's the only thing that you can do. And so we do have a great education job to help people really understand the, the breadth of what actually goes on in this, this alternative way <coughs> of uh, providing the education. All right, well, uh, signposting and I went on and on, didn't I? Here we go. Let's go to our second one. All righty. Online course design. So most, most online courses, certainly, and most traditional courses, um, depend, regardless of industry, are disciplined by course outcomes. What do you want the students to learn upon completion of the course? It's just best practice. It truly is best practice in course design. Point. So now counterpoint. We all, know, we all know that we need to change the way we are offering online legal education. By the way, could I just say, mm -hmm. may, maybe we don't all agree that we need to change legal education. <laughs> so but just go with us on that journey for a second. Go ahead. <laughs> it needs to be, we need to try and make it more affordable. <clears throat> and a curricular change is necessary. Is this, is this a reason why we need the distinction? to let the students, to let the learners know that we are attempting a curricular change. <coughs> Just another argument. I'm trying to play both sides here. I think it's obvious which side I lead to. <laughs> <laughs> do, uh, do most of you have, uh, uh, night, anybody have night programs? OK, so the night program students are the classic distance learning uh, students, right? They're the classic students who benefit, prefer, enjoy uh, this kind of education. So they might very well be the people who would choose the program that was labeled the distance learning program because of the attributes that go along with it, the flexibility that Jack mentioned and not having to go to campus and all the rest of that kind of stuff. So there are indeed these interesting segments in the market as we were talking about. Okay, so uh, to uh, elaborate on this one a little bit, let's talk about curriculum for a second and the design of curriculum. So we've talked a lot about the advancements of technology and how, and how it has changed the way we deliver knowledge. Um, the, the tools we can use today are far different than the tools we used in 1728 and, of course, 10 years ago. But what hasn't changed is the curriculum developed process, I believe. The, the, a well-developed and designed course, that has not changed. That process has not changed. And I honestly believe that it's almost um, those who don't, don't see that, that really contributes to the reticence of many in embracing online education. Ralph Tyler developed uh, the basic principles of curriculum instruction, and it's basically an outline um, and rationale for viewing, analyzing, and interpreting the curriculum. And when I say this, this is 
I, I like to use this model in developing a program, a course, and even a module in, in, in a course, in a face-to-face -face or even an online course. First, the objectives. What do, you, what do you want the student to know? What do you want them to be able to do upon completion of the module, the course, and the program? Learning experiences. What tools are you going to employ in the course in order for the student to achieve that? So again, this is on the module level. What, what tools are you going to employ so that the student will achieve that, mod, that objective that you set out for that module, for that course, or again, for that program? Organization. How are we going to organize all this information so that not only is it intuitive, of course, for the student, but also for the professor in the way that they're conveying and delivering the knowledge? And finally, how are we going to know that the students have achieved what we, what we said that they would? How, how can we assess that not only do they know the information, but that they can do it, that, that, they, can achieve, that they have achieved all those outcomes upon completion of the module, the program, or the course? By the way, I'll say Hope has a wonderful article on her LinkedIn page about uh, this uh, Ralph Tyler uh, uh, design principles. So uh, if you look up Hope Kentner on LinkedIn, you'll uh, get a chance to link in and uh, take a look at the article that uh, goes into a bit more uh, detail on this particular one. So I also, quickly, I want to um, share a quote. I was actually at a conference. Um, John Center was speaking, and he said, we are not changing the way knowledge is conveyed or changing how course objectives are developed. Rather, we are shifting the way the information is transmitted, preserved, and generated. I think that is the perfect sentence that en encapsulates what we are trying to convey here with the curriculum design process. It really has not changed. Online education is not that different, or distance education is not that different in terms of how we're developing everything. Yes, it's different as far as the tools, but that's it. Yeah, and, and uh, by the way, we're going to draw some distinctions here for a second. So an old-fashioned law school classroom might look like this. Law school class might look like this. There might be some other things that go on, things that drafting exercises, for example, or group activities in the, in the actual live sessions and so on. There might be a number of other things that go on. With more intentionality, with a bit more design, we tend to see a little bit richer experience uh, with a, different kinds of experiences for different kinds of students with different needs to learn. Earlier I talked about the emotional learner, where the person really needs to be able to connect uh, on an emotional level with the material in order for it to make sense to them and for them to retain it. Well, we also have, as we know, the kinesthetic folks and all the, those different uh, auditory versus active kind of learning styles. You just get a great deal more flexibility in a well-designed course. And this is, we're calling this a modern law school course, by the way, because this is not necessarily intended to be an online course. This could just as easily be your classroom course, could it not? Because there's really none of these tools you couldn't find a way to use in respect to your own, your live classroom course as well. So it's a well-designed course, whether it's an online course or a, or a live course, and it brings to it this richness of experience, of learning experiences to different kinds of learners, uh, which we know is necessary for them to be able to achieve it. Uh, this just takes that a step further. I just wanted to share with you the, just the assessment plan for the contracts course uh, that we conducted at Concord Law School way back when. Uh, this is just the part where we have formative and summative assessment for the different activities within the class. And so you have literally hundreds of uh, questions, uh, a dozen, uh, what is it, a dozen or more writing experiences uh, for the students. And this is all part of the teaching, right? Not just part of assessing whether <coughs> the students were successful or not. Um, and as you, those of you who know who do this kind of thing in your classes, what do students think of this kind of thing? What do you think? What do you think the reaction was to all those? Uh, let's just take one example. See that where it says 27 reading assignment quizzes? In other words, we, t we told them to read an assignment, and then we gave them a quiz afterwards on the content of that assignment. It was open book, I should tell you, it's open book and untimed. What do you think? What do you think the reaction was? No higher level thinking involved with that at all. Just regurgitation. They loved it. 
Oh, yeah. Wow. You know why they loved it? It was open book and untimed. And we loved it, too, for one main reason. Because if they didn't get it on the first pass, they got it on the second pass. Or we hoped they did. In other words, if the point was lost when they read the assignment, they got a chance to learn the most important things that we really wanted them to have when they took the reading assignment quiz later on. And if they needed to go read it to answer the quiz, so much the better. <laughs> well, as far as we were concerned. Though, if that's true, I'm part of the gravity of our white course. I would cut and paste the question in Google real quick, and it would pop up with an answer. It's like, cause I couldn't remember what the yep. question is, but I, that, that's one of the reasons I, I've ever questioned whether our online courses are effective because the studies are cheap. Yeah, well, let's talk about, we can talk about the cheating thing. Let's, let's make sure we, we come back to this cheating question. Um, and I want to come back to it because there's a couple more things coming that might be valuable in, in discussing it later. But make sure we, uh, we get to the cheating question, okay? Uh, it's unquestionably something that folks are afraid of. And the question is whether that fear is warranted or not. Or at least if it's warranted by comparison. So let's explore that in a little bit more detail. Okay. All right, so we are now going to go back to the um, initial question that we asked in the very beginning, and I know several of you came in, came in a little late. Um, do you want to go to the results? Yes. <coughs> we'll be revealing the results. Is that okay? We will be. All right. Nope. So for, oops, sorry. i got to go up. For those of you who didn't get a chance to answer yet, you can still answer right now. We'll see your answers come through to this particular question. And the question was, which of these do you use in your, in your classrooms? Now, by the way, oh, go ahead, Hope, sorry. Yeah, no. I didn't mean to talk about it. It probably doesn't matter too much whether you can read these individual lines or in the same order as they were on the other page. What do you think that we thought was going to happen? What would you guess? We figured it would look about like this. <laughs> because you're using a lot of these tools already. They're the same tools. They're the same tools that are being used in the online world as are also being used in the typical live classroom world. Sure, there's going to be some variation on particular, oh, there you go, there's our live update, some variation on, uh, on particular items. But in fact, the, the basic structures and uh, tools have, in, it, it appears to, uh, to our eyes, uh, been moving closer and closer together uh, over time. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Nope. I didn't mean to talk. That's to exactly talk what I was going to say. Okay. All right. Uh, so, any comments or questions about that one? There it goes. <laughs> Thank you for participating. All right. The 35 was. Oh, sorry. No, I just That's the, the syllabus. A lot of folks are using syllabi well, and PowerPoints. There. Yeah, syllabi, PowerPoints, and. Conference calls. Oh, is that? No. Website. Websites. Website. Yeah, class websites. Okay. All right. So you're signposting. I'm signposting. That's right. So that was our second area. It's modern learning, but things are coming together uh, versus the question of a necessary distinction. So let's go and talk about the live classrooms a little bit uh, in our next. Uh, Point counterpoint. Actually, this is you. Oh, this is me. Okay. So uh, when you give out a syllabus and you ask students to do reading assignments, these are asynchronous assignments, right? Uh, they do them on their own time, in their own space, whenever they want to. That's the very definition of asynchronous assignments. When you ask students to complete a uh, simulation on a website in your course, uh, this too is an asynchronous assignment. Uh, so the point is there's no reason for distinctions here because we're doing the same kinds of things in both settings. Uh, folks who are in an online course are being asked to read assignments just as they are in your, court, your live class. And similarly, both of you might be assigning the same work with respect to other kinds of rich media, watching videos, doing simulations, that sort of thing. On the other side of the coin, uh, the live classroom is really where it comes down to the rubber meets the road. And the question is whether or not the live classroom experience matches up. Because if we take it and say that everything asynchronous can be about the same today, what about that live classroom experience? And the counterpoint person says, you know, there are people who really want to sit in a room together. And uh, they want to have that kind of learning experience as opposed to the, the uh, experience of 
collaborating at a distance, which of course is uh, essential to the sort of distance learning model. So those are our points and counterpoints. So we're going to take a look at uh, the assignments, <laughs> lots of reading, both settings, lots of reading, and then of course live classroom technology. Now this is a snapshot of uh, me teaching a class at Concord Law School on the Indigo platform, which was the live proprietary live classroom uh, experience there. And how many of you have, have you taught live uh, online classes in a variety of different kinds of settings? Okay. So at one time you had to invent this stuff yourself. Now there's all kinds of these, right? All kinds of tools. We talked about Zoom a little bit earlier on. Uh, what are the key components, though, of an effective live classroom? And that's the really real reason I have the slide up there. First of all, you have to know who's there, especially if you're the teacher. But even if you're a participant, you want to know who's there. It's, I think, essential that there is a live chat capability going on. Some students, even though you could put them on video or put them on audio, are actually going to participate much more by typing in their comments and questions. And they appreciate the opportunity to do it in that fashion. That doesn't mean you can't call on them and bring them up on the video and make them do their thing when you want that to be part of the experience, right? But you'll get most of them participating most of the time if you create the right sort of environment with them in that text-oriented conversation that can be going on behind the scenes as the class is going on. Uh, because it engages more different kinds of learners. That's the reason why I think it's essential to the way you conduct your, your live online sessions. Then, of course, we've got our PowerPoint in the middle. We've got our video of the professor over to the right. And it's important to remember that professor video can be replaced by any student video or a number of student videos in the sort of Brady Bunch style. Everybody knows what I mean by the Brady Bunch style? This is where you have the six, the six kids and the two parents, and they all have little moving uh, thumbnail videos, and they're, they're talking to each other. Uh, there are indeed, of course, in, for example, Zoom, uh, as a, a teleconferencing uh, platform, the ability to have everybody look at everybody all the time uh, with the tools that we have available today. So how far along then would we say the online classroom has come to being like the live classroom? What's missing? Jack? Very little missing, and I would just, uh, for those of you who haven't used it, I, I'm really expensive. I'm like Dane Sprung for for one semester. Has anybody used Vantage Point? It's a Vantage Point is a Canadian plugin that sits in uh, Adobe Connect and gives you the ability to see the whole class, but their classmates can't. It leaves you the entire teaching facility for Adobe Connect, including all your polling and all the functions. You don't waste any of it with anything except your headshot or the student yep. speaking. And gives you live analytics and does pop up questions for the students to make sure that they're there and awake and happening. So okay. there's it's pricey, it's pricey. But if you if you take a look at Vantage Point, it's um, uh, Refined Data is the company. Google Refined Data Vantage Point. Yep. I get to, and if you've got the numbers, the pricing isn't even bad. So I think our, that's why I say arguably we can duplicate and improve the physical classroom. Online. So, so, on our question of do we need the word or do we not, if we can improve upon the physical classroom with distance learning tools, do we need the word? Uh, uh, I'll, maybe we do. Maybe, maybe it's better, sir. Um, you know, from from our end, like I think that we do a pretty good job of transmitting right classes, but oftentimes. Students will be on their cell phones, and you can see that they're they're like running down the street and stuff like that. And I was like, "Well, what are you doing? Why aren't you sitting at a desk or something, trying to pay attention and stuff like that?" Yeah. Oftentimes, it's not. I don't think it's bad from our end, but there's also the opposite end, like how how a student is experiencing it. And, and sometimes I just don't think that they, you know, I, I don't want to say they don't take it seriously, but it's like uh, they just want to make sure they're there. But sometimes it's like they're. Out on the street somewhere, it's yeah. like, how, how could you even pay attention? You know, if you're they're, they're running errands. Yeah. Yeah, during, during the class. Yeah. Now, the alternative, of course, I suppose, is they just don't show up for class in the live setting. What about that? Do you think that happens yeah. frequently enough? Or the alternative is they're buying things on Amazon while you're, while you're exactly. lecturing. They're well, they're in the room. <laughs> as long as you have a laptop. Right. Yes. Go ahead. 
Um, I would say one thing that I experienced, and I was doing this uh, from 2007 to 2009 with a chat box while somebody was presenting a PowerPoint was the way that I experienced business education. And I found it interesting <coughs> because some professors were extremely intentional about how they used chat yes. and said, like, okay, I'm going to post a couple of links. I want you guys to go to these links and then come back and give your feedback, yep. which ended up being very much like a think, pair, share sort of thing in a classroom experience. It yep. worked the same way right. in the learning experience for myself as a student. But other times, the professor was just kind of reading their slides, and some of us were interested in doing more and were chatting, and some people would get very irritated with those of us that were having a discussion, because they viewed <coughs> it as passing notes and a, like a violation of norms. So the fact that there was never any discussion about what the norms were, if you were coming yeah. from one class and thinking, oh, this is a valuable educational tool, I'm going to continue the same thing. And somebody else is like, you're talking over the teacher. Yep. You're horrible. Why are you here? There's a level of expectation setting that's really important, both for the professors and for the students. Yes. Because and I, I'm a big fan of moderated chat, if you're using chat in a classroom, so that the professor can manage the experience for the participants to be sure that it doesn't have some of these kinds of difficulties with it. Uh, but without it, you still have this rich environment that's going on at the same time as the class. Chris, last word on this one. Yeah, you move on. I don't know if your premise in this presentation is that if you remove the distance, that is just learning regardless. Yeah. I'm not sure whether that is the assumption that you're taking because I will say that we are still far away from the quality in terms of the distance, both in terms of the design, instructional designers, yep. the platform that we're using, yep. and even our instructors. Many of them are really not ready, and some of the classes that you think that are distance learning, when you look at it from pure pedagogical reasons, we're really cheating the students. You know, so I'm not sure that if you just remove the distance, that it is purely learning. I think we still have a long way to go. Well, and that's why we're discussing it, because I don't think it's a clear answer either. But we will get everybody a chance to vote later on it, yeah. on this question. <laughs> okay. So uh, signposting again, that was our third point. Let's go on to our fourth point. So we'll just take this quickly. Um, we're, we're running short on time. Um, so, point here is, is the, is the large lecture hall any different? You have screens in the back of the classroom. I'm sorry, screens in the front of the classroom. In, in students can hear, there's microphones. Is it truly any different? Counterpoint? No, go ahead. We'll just, <laughs> we're, we're, we are running late. Okay. Image. Um, as, as Clayton Christensen said, anything beyond the 10th room of the large lecture hall is truly distance learning. <laughs> And they're sitting on their computers, too, by the way, in most cases. Shopping. <laughs> Which brings us to the cheating point. And the real question is, by comparison, is it much more of a problem in the distance learning world than it is in the live classroom? That's really the question to ponder, I think. And uh, I've encountered this argument many, many times from regulators. How do you know it's them doing the work? How do you know they're paying attention in live class? <laughs> you don't. But if they take an assessment after they do the reading assignment, which we illustrated earlier, if they have to answer questions during the video, which you can easily do, uh, then you get a better sense of whether they're actually getting something out of it. And sure, we need security for final exams and some other things like that to be sure that that's not going on. But security lacks in final exams in live settings fairly often as well. Uh, you know, in my school, it was always the faculty secretaries who went to administer the final exams, not the professors. And they didn't know who I was. They didn't check IDs. So we have to call it, let's make it fair. <laughs> let's make the arguments fair on this question of whether cheating happens in one setting versus another. All right, so live lecture halls. Uh, let's talk about group discussions. Group discussions. So uh, group discussions are, is it the most widely, widely used tool in both the online and the in-class classroom. So we thought we'd compare it here today. Obviously, the brick and mortar, the face-to-face -face classroom, I, I grabbed that. Oh, you got it. OK, go for um, it. And the online classroom. So first, classroom community. Online group discussions create community. They foster the connections, the 
um, interaction between the faculty and the students and the students to students to, to develop that, on, that learning community I keep referencing online. But it happens in both the in-class and the online classroom. Higher order thinking, I, it, essential. And group discussions do that. How, thinking beyond, going a step further in your thought. I'm gonna take these really quickly. Case study analysis, a great example of being able to bring the experiential into the, into the classroom. Case study, students can share their personal experience, their knowledge, their skills <coughs> in, in, in solving a case. How would, they, how would they approach it in real life? Improved presentation skills. And personally, while this is definitely the case in the face-to-face -face and the online as far as recordings, this is great in, in, in terms of groups because of peer feedback. But online classroom goes a step further, formative assessment. Formative assessment allowing the professor to ensure that the students are achieving, are learning what they are supposed to learn at a particular point in the course. Reflection. The group discussion in the online environment allows students to think, think before they speak, so to speak. Um, to really craft something, to, to think deeply about something and express something. It gives them time. It doesn't have to be right there, right then. So it, it just allows that, which again, I think lends to higher order thinking and improved writing skills. Depending upon the, um, the, the, the nature of the online discussion, um, is it, is it formal? Is it informal? Is it, quote, casual banter? It's, it's improved writing skills, but also some social etiquette can be in, in place there, too. Okay, so I'm signposting again. Those are our uh, four main points. Uh, we're going to get to uh, more conversation in a second, but we thought we, you'd probably want to know where we stand, as if we haven't already told you, uh, on, these, on these core questions. Uh, so again, oh, I hope I think you were going to do this one. Is education evolving, or is this just an entirely different way of, of teaching and learning? Back to the question, the core question. There you go. So uh, we think it's a different. We think it, education is evolving. We don't think that the distinction makes very much sense uh, today, because we think this, this world is going away. Uh, and it's going away extremely rapidly, faster than any of us can expect, uh, because the uh, future looks more like this. The future of law practice looks more like this, and certainly the futures of the people that are sitting in the classrooms with us look a lot more like this in terms of the way they're going to conduct themselves and have always conducted themselves. You know, I was watching the, one of the, the slides in the, one of the plenaries this morning, and I don't know if you read uh, some of the experiences of the students up there. The, the student, one student listed that uh, he or she was born in 1997. Born in 1997. And of course, that's who you've got, born in 1997, digital natives, the millennial generation, etc. Uh, this is more like the future. And so we thought we would kind of uh, come sort of toward the end by talking a little bit about um, Maslow's hierarchy. Everybody familiar with Maslow's hierarchy before? It begins with sort of physiological need, and then we work our way up through, are you clicking for me? You want me to click? Okay. We work our way up through uh, various psychological needs, all the way up to self-actualization. So we thought we'd share with you the Maslow's hierarchy for the students that you have in your class. <laughs> Digital natives are going to demand, we think, all education to be very different than it has been. And these tools, these differences we've had, eventually going to come out in the wash. That's our view anyway of this one. All right, so your turn to vote. What do you think? <coughs> oh, we got to move to that question, we don't we? Okay. Yeah, we got to move to that question for them. Sorry, got to go back. Oh, there we go. Oh, look at this. There we go. <laughs> Now, don't <laughs> let it influence. <laughs> Can you turn that off? I think um, Mentimeter, the, the in real time results. Yes. Uh, yeah, you, you can, well. We found that useful in polling software we use. Is, what do you use? We use poll everywhere. Okay. But, uh, you know, yep. people, people change their answer depending on when they're.
<laughs> well, I'll tell you what I'll do is I'll, I'll take it away for a second. Well, while the rest of the remainder of the audience writes. I typically use poll everywhere, but I found this and I've always wanted to try it, so we tried yeah, it. We thought we'd try it.